This is Twit. The EU is doing doing the most right now. <laughs> the EU is making sure that there are regulations in place for just about everything regarding tech. And honestly, I've got mad respect for the EU because the EU don't play. And in part of uh, what the the group, the block, is working on at the moment, uh, it is focused on AI. Joining us to talk about the act that was just passed is Amelia David of The Verge. Welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. It's so great to have you here. So I was hoping that you could start by telling us a little bit about what the EU Act is, uh, how long the the block has kind of been working through the approval process and if we know when it will be kind of fully enacted. Yeah. So the EU has been working on the AI Act since around 2021, middle of 2021. And over that time, the Act has gone through several changes um, and it's basically going to put a bunch of guidelines around how companies like OpenAI, Meta, and Google can basically do business with their AI models in Europe. And that means they have to make sure that it's safe and prove that it's safe. And and it will also go down, they call it downstream, um, for other companies that are going to be using AI, they have to also show that they're using it safely. So that's essentially what the EU AI Act is. Um, it's one of the biggest and the one of the first, although technically China did um, AI regulations first, but it's the biggest and most sweeping AI regulation that we have right now. Wow. Yeah, it is. Um, it again, very impressive. <laughs> so let's let's talk about how the act has changed since it was first introduced uh, back in 2021. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about why its introduction is 
is interesting as well, uh, given when it came versus when we saw all of the generative AI start to, to pop up? Yeah, so it it really started taking shape just around the time generative AI started um, really blowing up. Um, to be fair, the EU has been talking about regulating some sort of artificial intelligence or machine learning for a little bit, but it is one of the, the bigger regional blocks to really talk about protecting consumers and data and things like that. And what's really interesting here is before before it was um, approved or provisionally approved, the EU has very convoluted um, voting <laughs> systems <laughs> for their laws. Um, so before yesterday, when they voted on the EU AI Act, um, it was originally going to be a lot stricter than what we see now. There was going to be um, outright banning on using artificial intelligence for biometric purposes. Mm -hmm. So basically facial recognition and profiling. So it was originally completely banned. In this new version, or the version that all the countries in the EU agreed, it will be, they will have some sort of carve out for law enforcement. So only law enforcement will be able to use facial recognition technology, for example. So it isn't completely banned. And there were a lot of other compromises too. It used to be more strict on what's called general purpose AI. Mm -hmm. um, essentially what that is are the foundation models or large language models like GPT-4, Gemini, and Llama 2. And they were supposed to be more strict on how uh, these models were going to be used in the EU. Mm -hmm. They've softened that a little bit. Um, uh, essentially asking companies to like, can you send us the model and we'll evaluate it rather than saying you can't do this, this and this. So it's a lot more permissive than when it first started. It's still, it's still, you know, it's still regulation. It's right. policy. Yeah. So, but it's not as like, strict over time it's before. yeah it's gotten a little less strict now in fact th that's kind of my next question for you because even though so from 2021 till now there were a lot of changes made it's been approved but france for example still has some problems with the legislation yeah. uh can yeah. you tell us a little bit about what the ongoing criticism is sure. of the legislation Okay, to be clear, even though this has been passed, um, it's not going into force until like 2026, maybe. So there's still, you know, time to either adjust or, or, or fix something with it. But France has been one of the more vocal um, critics of the AI Act. Um, one of the biggest um, open source AI startups is Mistral. It's a company that was um, started in France, is still based in France, and it's becoming really popular among software developers and researchers and AI engineers, and it's just started um, doing partnerships with Microsoft, for example. So France really wants to keep that momentum going. Mm. They think this is a good thing for their economy, a homegrown AI company in the way that OpenAI is a homegrown US company. And for the French government, specifically um, Emmanuel Macron, he has said that the AI Act would restrict an innovation within Europe. So they were the ones who really pushed for a lot more of the like the loosening up of the rules they want a lot more <laughs> loosened up but in the end the french um minister that's in the eu had voted for it but there is still time to maybe soften it up a little bit more 
Got it. And you you briefly mentioned a little bit about the open source uh, stuff. I'm curious, what are some of the areas where the act falls short, at least uh, in in regard to maybe criticisms, but also I think just uh, some of this feels it's it feels objective. It does not feel subjective. I mean, because there are some places where uh, we've seen criticism for a long time when it comes to generative AI systems and the act is maybe showing its age a little bit, which is wild to say because of how quickly generative AI moves. Right. So, yeah. What are some areas where it kind of falls short? One of the things that people were talking about, like you said, was open source. Um, the open source community actually openly lobbied the EU to be friendly is a good term to use, but they really wanted to let EU leaders know that any restrictive act was bad for the open source community. They feel that any regulation means it's very difficult for open source companies, which are usually smaller um, and sometimes just like more research projects than anything would be overregulated and they can't pay any fines, for example. But that also meant that there isn't a lot of um, fences around what open source um, developers could do, especially if they have a very large, powerful model. So that is still an issue. And in fact, the open source foundation model, um, security and, and things like that are also now being looked at by the U.S. government. So the EU AI Act doesn't have a lot of strength around that. The other thing that is notably missing in the act is more guidelines around data. And which is weird because the EU is known for very strong data protections, but they don't say anything about um, training data and copyright. They basically say, or the law basically says that you should follow existing rules around data protection. And that would be the GDPR. It doesn't really <laughs> jive with mm -hmm. what um, AI tends to do with data. So it's still missing. Like it's not talking about the, yes, the EU AI Act isn't talking about data privacy, but it's also not talking about how can these companies be using data, especially copyrighted data, which apparently trains a lot of AI models. They just say, follow the rules, even if the GDPR doesn't say anything about that either, because it is older. So, and a lot of these more powerful um, models, like general purpose AI models, have kind of gotten past a lot of the issues that the EU AI Act is trying to do mm -hmm. because they're much better now. So also they already have the data from before and the AI Act doesn't say anything about like, do you retroactively take that out? There's still, there. you can definitely tell that it took years to make this and that there have been a lot of negotiations Absolutely. around it. Absolutely, yeah, it sounds like it. Now, uh, the last thing I'm, I'm kind of curious about as was the case with the EU's GDPR, which, of course, uh, kind of seems to have led other countries to create their own data protection policies or inspire in some way their data protection policies. Uh, do you think that other countries are going to use the EU's AI Act as a model, as a framework, as a bit of inspiration for creating AI legislation? Or are have you heard, like in the U.S. and in other places, criticism of this act suggesting that maybe it's not the right way for those countries to go? Well, we haven't seen a GDPR in the U.S., right? We've only right. seen one state like try to do it, um, California. So in, in this, it's probably going to be the same thing. It will be a model for other countries to look at, but it will not be a template. Um, and I say that specifically because country, different countries, different regions have a different idea what regulation would mean for them or what innovation could mean for them. Especially here in the U.S., 
um, there is, well, number one, most of the biggest AI developers are based in the U.S. and the U.S. does not want to let go of that um, of, of that like innovation um, advancement. So whatever regulation the U.S. does come up with, it will be very specific to the U.S. And we've already heard a lot of U.S. policymakers, for example, talk about the EU AI Act and say it is interesting to note that it is happening, but we will not be following that. We will be doing it our own way. Um, so it's it's going to be a model. They're going to look at, oh, this is what they did. This is what they said is important. It's not as important to us, so we'll take that off. Yeah, that's it, it's in the same vein. We don't have a lot of data protection laws in other countries in the same vein as the GDPR. We're probably not going to see the same exact like looking regulation with AI. That makes sense. Um, Amelia, I want to thank you so much for your time today for uh, honestly crawling through this this legislation and helping us to understand it and break it apart. Uh, it's all very complicated. And obviously, when you're you're trying to uh, regulate something as big and as uh, multifaceted and as quickly changing as AI, there's a lot that has to be involved. So uh, sincerely appreciate that uh, you have taken the time to do that. Of course, folks can over, head over to TheVerge.com to check out your work, but is there anywhere else they could go to follow along to keep up with what you're doing? Sure. If you want to see me try to make sense of the EU, um, I am over at um, on Twitter at Mia David. That's M-I-Y-A David. That's also the same on Blue Sky. <laughs> And I am on Threads, um, and that would be C-R-I-M-E-D-Y um, on Threads. Awesome. Thanks so much for watching this little chunk of Tech News Weekly. If you'd like to get the full episode, well, head over to twit.tv slash TNW. There you'll find buttons you can click or tap to subscribe to the entire show in audio and video formats. Or just look in the description. We've got links down there as well. 